you have your Bible, turn with me to Isaiah 9. Isaiah chapter 9, we're going to be looking at verses 6 and 7 today. Now, as we continue with our Advent sermon series through the month of December, we find ourselves considering the notion of peace this morning. Now, last week we considered the hope we have in Christ, both in his first advent, his first coming, and as we look to his second coming, his second advent. Today we encounter something that I believe all of humanity seeks, that is peace. From where do we find true and lasting peace? You see, one thing that I think unites us as the human race is the overarching desire for peace. Think about it. Although directed in many different directions, some directions more peaceful than others, one thing that most of humanity, if not all, desires is peace. Now, I know that many of us look around at the many evils of this world that take place at the hands of humans that are seemingly less than peaceful, we would think in our minds. But even at the heart of many of the evils of this world, there is a lack of or a desire for peace. Both unbelievers and believers desire peace. We want peace with each other, and we want peace with ourselves. Now, from an unbeliever perspective, consider the following. Alanis Morissette, peace of mind for five minutes, that's what I crave. The late, great Jimi Hendrix, when the power of love overcomes the love of power, the world will know peace. John Lennon, imagine all the people living life in peace. You may say, I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be as one. You see, this is a deep desire for peace in the lives of unbelievers, unless, of course, these three individuals repented and believed in Christ, that of which I have not seen. But even those who are outside of the faith desire peace, which leads me to believe that both unbelievers and believers have an overarching desire for peace within themselves as well as peace with others. And most of our peaceful pursuits are directed toward us and directed toward those around us. We want to be satisfied with ourselves, and we want, to be set, we want others to be satisfied with us as well. Well, why is this so? Why is this the case? Well, I think that the pursuit of peace is our common heritage because all of humanity is created in the image of God. You see, all of humanity, if they've ever had a single strand of DNA to be found within them, is created in the image of God. And this means that all of humanity is created equal, equally. They're created male and female, all worthy of dignity and respect. And this also means that man is like God and represents God. As Wayne Grudem notes, the fact that man is in the image of God means that man is like God in the following ways. Intellectual ability, moral purity, spiritual nature, dominion over the earth, creativity, ability to make ethical choices, and immorality. immortality. Excuse me. With this in mind, it leads me to believe that all of us, because we are created in the image of God, we long for peace as true peace is only found in the Lord. Again, this is misdirected in so many different ways because sin has entered the world and we are all directly affected by sin. Nonetheless, the original intention in God's perfect creation was for us to be at peace with him and at peace with each other. And then when sin entered the world, this longing, this longing for peace that is innate within us to be at peace with God was then tarnished, leading all of us to look to so many other things in order to be at peace. Church, there are so many things in this world that offer us peace. They offer peace to us, but there is only one in whom true peace is found, the Prince of Peace. Jesus Christ. And so many, even those among us, are without peace. So many are longing for and looking for peace in places that promise peace, yet lead to emptiness. And it's not even this desire to be at peace with God. It's the longing to have inner peace 
with themselves. And there are so many different damning avenues people are pursuing peace. But let's be a peaceful people who look to the Prince of Peace and who turn others to the Prince of Peace in order to receive true and lasting peace. And the question before all of us this morning is, do you need peace? Maybe you're a believer, yet you're in a difficult season of life, and your eyes have been turned away from the peace found in Jesus to the chaos around you. Be reminded of the true peace that you have in Christ this morning, even in the midst of the storms of life. Maybe you've never trusted in the Prince of Peace. May may you find peace and rest in Christ through repentance and faith this morning. Praise be to God for peace found in the Prince of Peace. And all glory to Christ that we are the continual recipients of that peace now and forevermore. So if you're able, would you stand as we read Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. The word of God reads, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Would you pray with me? Father, as we approach your inspired holy word this morning, God, I pray that your spirit would use your word in your power to change us, to remind us of the peace that is found in Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. God, we pray for peace with you. We pray for peace with others. We pray your peace would find those who do not have peace that you would bring redemption, reconciliation. And that, God, we'd be reminded this time of year that's so chaotic for many. It's also very difficult for many. We would be reminded that even in the chaos that surrounds us, in the storms that surround us, in the difficulties that surround us, we can have peace. Peace. Through Christ, your Son. May you receive all the glory in Christ the praise this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So, as we look at this text this morning, I'm going to pose and answer four questions about our lack of peace, why there is no peace, and in whom we whom in whom, excuse me, peace is to be found. But before I do, I want to set the stage for the passage of scripture that we're considering in Isaiah chapter 9. Now, Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 is one of the most well-known prophecies about Jesus that we look to and read during the Christmas season. Not only that, we often return to this passage quite often to point others to the Messianic identity as this prophecy was made 700 years about Jesus before Jesus. And so this passage of this message of peace and this message of a ruler coming to restore Israel was a message of hope, very much like the message of Micah, uh, Micah chapter 5 that we considered last week. And as I'm focusing on these two verses today, let me give some context for what is happening. Now, Isaiah 8 ended in the darkness and gloom of a corrupt and wicked people who were seeking occult wisdom from mediums and rejecting the wisdom of God, people who were roaming the earth in anger and despair and cursing God. In the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, Galilee of the nations, the Gentiles, is called a humbled land, a people walking in darkness, a people living without hope and without God in the world. Then as Isaiah 9 opens up, all of this changes. As there was a time of darkness, as there was a time of gloom, there is now a time of light. As the people who walked in darkness have now seen a great light, Isaiah 9-2 tells us. 
And because of this light shining into darkness, the people respond in overpowering joy. We see in verses 3 through 5. And the natural response to God bringing people from darkness to life, to light, is overpowering joy. And so the nation is enlarged. The people rejoice as on a day when a great war has ended in total victory with abundant plunder for everyone. The joy is likened to the day of Midian's defeat, a famous story from the era of the judges when, God, when Gideon defeated the overwhelming oppressive Midianites without a sword in his hand from Judges 6 and 7. And at that time, Israel was powerless to save itself. They were enslaved to the Midianites. And God caused the terror of the Lord to come on them when the light from Gideon's small army of 300 men ripped through the darkness. And the evil forces of Midian turned on themselves and imploded, destroying one another. And as the result, the oppressive yoke and the rod of their shoulders, the staff of their oppressor, was shattered, as we see in 9-4 here. And all trampling boots and bloodied garments were destined for fire, verse 5. Then we arrive at these verses where we're introduced to a child that is to be born, a son, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, whose dominion has no end as, his, as he reigns on the throne of David. Now, as already noted, this is a prophecy about Jesus, and I want to key in uh, on Jesus, the giver of peace this morning as the prince of peace, but first, how do we know this is about Jesus? Well, in Luke 1 and 2, the declarations made about the birth of Jesus, we see similar language. First, in Luke 1, 32, in the foretelling of Jesus' birth to Mary, it says, He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord will give him the throne of his father David, and he will rule over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom, in his kingdom there will be no end. Then in Luke 2.11, in the declaration from angels to a group of shepherds regarding the Messiah, we see similar language used to pronounce the birth of Jesus. It says, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And so this wonderful counselor, this mighty God, this everlasting Father and Prince of Peace is indeed Jesus Christ. Christ was the one who was to come. He is the one who has come, and he has done what no one else could ever do, defeat sin and death for his people. Jesus was born to die, and having raised from the dead, rules and reigns as the Prince of Peace, the only giver of everlasting and eternal peace. And so I want to pose some questions about this Prince of Peace. But before we consider Jesus as the Prince of Peace, the first question I want us to answer is this. Why are we not at peace with God? If Jesus is the Prince of Peace, why are we not at peace with God? Now, as I mentioned earlier, both unbelievers and believers pursue peace. But what we need to first understand is that all of us, at one point in time, were all unbelievers. Meaning, all of us either were at one point or are now not at peace with God. And all of us were born into this world, dead in our trespasses and sins. Which means we are naturally at odds with God. We are naturally enemies of God. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work, and the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. And there is no peace with God because we are naturally his enemies. As Paul would say, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, Satan. So Paul would say, naturally, we follow Satan because we are at odds with God. And if you do not have peace with God, guess what you're going to do? You're going to pursue peace in many other things of this world in order to attempt to fill this longing, this desire for peace that is innate in all created in the image of God. This is why it should never surprise us when people run to other things in pursuit of peace. 
This is why it should never surprise us when unbelievers act like unbelievers, when unbelievers run to things of this world, when they run to sin, when they run to gratify the desires of this flesh. We should never expect someone who is an unbeliever, naturally at odds with God, to not run to depravity in their pursuit of peace. We shouldn't do it. Well, I can't believe they did that. Why not? They're unbelievers. They're depraved, totally depraved, as we all are, born into this world. We should expect these things because they are behaviors that come natural to the flesh, natural to those who are not at peace with God. This is why it's so easy for you and I to run away from God and toward other things in pursuit of peace, even after we've repented and believed, because it's a natural part of our fallen flesh. So why are we not at peace with God? Well, the answer can be simply summed up as sin. You know, we all could answer that question. Well, it's sin, you know. We're not at peace with God because of sin. We have turmoil within ourselves. We have turmoil with others. We lack peace within ourselves and with others because we are not naturally at peace with God, meaning we are without true peace altogether. We're not good. We don't seek God. We have all turned aside. We've all become worthless, Paul says in Romans 5. We are not at peace because of the sin that separates us from God. Now, it's easy for many to think that they have some sort of peace with God because of their works, because of their efforts, because of their merits, or just trying to be a good person. But this is far from the truth. It's easy for many, especially in the Bible Belt, to think they're at peace with God because they grew up going to church or they give financially to a church or they were baptized in a church. But this is far from the truth. If we're not repenting of our sin and following Jesus, then there is no peace with God. And because of sin, ultimately, there is no peace. Second question. Why do we need peace with God? Why do we need peace with God? You may look at this question and think, isn't that the same question as the first? (laughs) Why do we need peace with God? And to a degree, yes, we need peace with God because of sin. Why are we not at peace with God because of sin? Why do we need peace with God because of sin? Yeah. But I want to elaborate a bit further with this question than with the first that goes beyond just the simple answer of sin. Why do we need peace with God? Well, first, we need peace with God because all other things we pursue in search of peace are worthless and fleeting, leaving us empty and without true peace. And one thing that I think is important for us to realize this morning is that Satan wants you to have peace. Satan wants you to be at peace. Now, that might sound strange, but Satan most definitely wants you to have peace. Let me explain myself. The peace Satan promises is not the peace God promises. But as long as Satan convinces us that we are at peace with ourselves and at peace with each other and at peace with God, he has done what he desires to do. You see, Satan promises peace through so many godless, devastating, traumatic, and damaging avenues that may seem harmless on the surface, but they are destructive. He is certainly the one who seeks to kill, steal, and destroy. And while we hear these verbs and think of violence, war, and gore, many of the tactics of the enemy are not carried out with a weapon, but they're carried out in the name of peace, tranquility. And freedom. Church, the enemy is promising peace to those around us, and he is destroying them with his idea of peace. You see, the enemy is much better at evangelizing his peace, much more than we are at evangelizing and pointing others to the true and only peace that is found in the Prince of Peace. So many right now are being led astray in pursuit of peace within themselves. By Satan, it's destroying them and destroying their souls. This can be through faulty religions. Those who, where people think they find peace in a false god or a false deity. There's so many claiming peace with God through a religion that teaches a false gospel. 
We also live in a culture that promises peace as long as you are true to yourself. If you just be you or be who you want to be and be who you are, however you wish to chase that out is up to you, but you will be at peace. And so many are being led into this destructive trap and these satanic secular ideologies that claim to give you peace. And how is the enemy doing this? Well, he's doing it all in the name of peace. Do you want peace within yourself? Do you want peace with those around you? Then this is how you have to believe. This is what you have to do. This is how you are to respond and what you are to say. And it's happening right under our noses. All in the name of peace. But this satanic idea of peace is superficial. You see, the enemy's promised peace is an illusion. It's a mirage. It's like the sojourner wandering through the desert without any water. His body is dehydrated, his thirst longing to be quenched, and he looks up ahead and his weary eyes see an oasis, flourishing palm trees, a glimmering body of water, and a mesmerizing waterfall. And the sojourner begins to run toward this oasis that promises to quench his thirst and hydrate his body. However, in his pursuit, the closer he gets, the clearer it becomes that this is only an illusion. His eyes are playing tricks on him. It's a mirage. This is the type of peace offered by Satan. This is the mirage, the illusion that leads so many astray, and it's no peace at all. And it affects us, church. It affects us. Not just in those around us, but in us. In our own selves. And the question before us is, where do you seek peace? Do you seek your peace in God? Or do you seek your peace in religion, maybe? Meditation, exercise, family, job? Church, acceptance, sexuality, politics, television, social media, food? Alcohol, and on and on and on it goes. You fill in the blank. There's so many things this world offers us in the name of peace, and all those things will do is destroy us. Even under the umbrella of Christianity, you can seek peace through religion and never find it. So many carry out religious practices. Maybe they serve in the church, volunteer, and do many good things in pursuit of peace, but if peace is sought in doing things, then again, it will leave you empty without peace. So why do we need peace with God? First, we need peace with God because of sin. Second, we need peace with God because every other avenue of this superficial peace will not give us lasting peace. Because of our sin, we are enemies of God, which means there is only one thing directed toward us, and that's God's wrath. And so, because we are enemies of God, we run to worldly things in order to satisfy that desire for peace. And at the end of these pursuits, there remains God's wrath. And we need peace with God because there is no true peace apart from peace with God. We can make all sorts of claims. We can exhaust ourselves in endless pursuits. We can do all sorts of things in the name of peace. But at the end of the day, there is no peace third question. How do we obtain peace with God? If we need peace, how do we obtain this peace? Where does this peace come from? Well, the answer is Jesus. Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Colossians 1, 15 through 23. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on heaven or or on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. And you, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by this death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. 
If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. How do we have peace with God? It's through the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, having made peace with us through the cross. Jesus obtained peace on our behalf by becoming a sacrifice for us. On the cross, he took our sins upon himself. He absorbed God's wrath in himself that was originally directed at us because of our sins. On the cross, he bore the wrath deserved by us so that we might have peace with God. And Jesus promises to all who repent and follow him that their sins are forgiven. That the dividing wall of hostility that once existed between us and God has been torn down. And now there is everlasting peace. But never miss that this peace does not come through anything we have done. But it comes through everything Christ has done for us on the cross. As the Apostle Paul puts forth. And as king, Jesus creates this peace in his kingdom. He is our peace, and it is his peace that both keeps the hearts of his people and rules in them. He is not only a peaceable prince, and his reign peaceable, but he is the author and giver of all good, all that, all that peace which is the present and future bliss of his people. Do you lack peace this morning? Do you lack peace this holiday season? Are your holidays difficult? Jesus is the Prince of Peace. He reigns as Prince, which is a common word for a government official, yet under his rule, he is the bringer of peace and is characterized by peace. Prince of Peace. Jesus brings total peace. He brings total shalom something earthly princes could never do. Further, he brought peace by recon reconciling enemies to the Father through his death on the cross and now gives us the experience of peace as we trust him. He abides within us. Jesus gives us peace with God. He allows us to experience the peace of God and will one day bring universal peace, fulfilling the promises of God. John 14, 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. Jesus gives eternal peace by his death on the cross. Do you need peace this morning? There's no other place you will find peace. And all of this hinges on a birth. All of this hinges on a birth. The birth of Christ, our Savior and Lord. He is all of these things for us. And when seasons of chaos and seemingly a lack of peace arise around you, look to Christ. Look to Christ. If this time of year is not a time of peace, but a time of pain, which it is for so many families and individuals, look to Christ. Find your comfort in Christ. Find your joy in Christ. In the midst of sorrow, find comfort in Christ. In the midst of grief, grieve with hope. This is not all there is. This life is fleeting. Christ will return for all that is His. And this is temporary. Do not superficially act as if everything is okay, but in the midst of everything not being okay, remember that Christ is the wonderful Counselor. He's mighty God, everlasting Father and Prince of Peace. And if you are in Him, He is all of those things to you. Thomas Watson wrote this. If God be our God, He will give us peace in trouble. When there is a storm without, He will make peace within the world can create trouble in peace, but God can create peace in trouble. Fourth question. What is the extent of the peace that comes from the Prince of Peace? What is the extent of this peace? His rule, his reign, and his peace are eternal 
and infinite. Look at verse 7. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. His peace will extend without end. And when Christ returns to make all wrongs right and to establish the new heavens and the new earth, where we will rule and reign with him, no one will be able to successfully oppose his authority or undermine the positive effects of his government, which includes his peace. He will rule on the throne of David and reestablish his kingdom. And this implies the ultimate fulfillment of the Davidic covenant through a messianic figure who we know is Jesus. He will rule justly and rightly forevermore, and eternal peace is all we have to look forward to forever and ever and ever. Church, again, there are so many things that offer us peace this holiday season and every day of our lives. We're bombarded with things that bring us satisfaction, that bring us joy, that bring us peace. There are so many that we know, maybe it's you, maybe it's a family member, that are pursuing peace in all the wrong places. Maybe it's us. But church, look to Jesus for your peace. And when you're without peace, remind yourself that Jesus broke down the dividing wall of hostility between us and God and that he is the author and giver of peace. We are no longer enemies of God. But we are a people who can have peace in the midst of chaos. It seems this like a paradox to be in the midst of a storm, yet be able to say that you have peace because of Jesus. It makes no sense to the world. But let's also be a people who patiently point others to the peace to be found in Christ. Pray with me.